Half Magic by Edward Eager, 7, How It Ended. Who gets the charm today, said Martha early next morning. We've all had a turn now. Do we start over and take seconds, or should we agree on something and wish it together? I think we ought to give it a day of rest, said Catherine. After all, today is, after all, today is Sunday. And once the other children thought about it, they agreed that magic on Sunday didn't seem quite right. Or at least there was a chance that it wouldn't be. And the four children were taking no further chances. Now they knew how difficult the charm could be when roused. So Catherine spent the morning reading the Ingoldsby legends, which she had just discovered. And Mark built derricks with his Meccano set. Jane humored Martha by playing dolls with her, a pursuit Jane usually scorned, but she was still feeling kindly toward her family. As a result of yesterday's adventure, her true nature reasserted itself during the course of the game, however, and many a doll was stabbed to the heart or burned at the stake before the morning was over. The four children all hated big noon dinners on Sunday. So when hunger reared its hideous head, they just had soup and toast. And it was right after that that Mr. Smith arrived and asked if they and their mother would like to come for a drive with him and picnic supper afterwards. He said he knew of a wonderful picnic place with a river and swings and a meadow and woods, and he had six box, lunch, box lunches made up at the Minard's pastry shop. Jane and Mark and Catherine and Martha could hardly wait to start. What is it that makes box lunches always sound so delicious, Catherine wondered. It makes you think there might be almost anything inside, duck eggs and nectar and kinds of sandwiches nobody ever had before. Their mother said she had a headache and thought she better stay home, which didn't sound like her at all. The four children stared at her. You never have headaches, said Mark. You never want to stay home and spoil things either, said Catherine. It won't be any fun without you, said Jane. And of course, after that, the children's mother had to give in and five minutes later, away they went. The picnic place proved to be all that was ideal, as Mr. S as Mr. Smith had said it would. Martha went picking butterfly weed in the meadow, only it seemed to be bee weed, too, and one stung her, and Catherine wandered romantically through the woods and was almost sure, sh sh sure she saw a snake, and Jane and Mark tried to build stepping stones across the river and fell in with their clothes on. And altogether, it was a typical happy family outing. The box lunches turned out to contain, not to contain any duck eggs or nectar, but the sandwiches were sufficiently unusual. And there were deviled eggs and potato salad and lots of little assorted cakes that the children had fun with, deciding which ones they liked best and trying to trade off the others. Supper was eaten around a bonfire deftly constructed by Mark and Mr. Smith, and stories were told and songs were sung until what with one thing and another, it was long after nine o'clock when they packed themselves into the car once more and drove home through the purple darkness. And the four children were all so tired and happy and sunburned and sleepy that they went straight to bed with almost no ado. Martha, as sometimes happens, was so tired that she couldn't seem to go to sleep, and she noticed that Mr. Smith didn't go home right away but sat talking to their mother for what seemed like hours and hours. And much later, in the middle of the night, she woke up, possibly as a result of too many cakes, and was almost sure she heard their mother crying. This couldn't be, of course. Martha had never heard of a mother who cried, and certainly not their mother. So happy and strong and busy and sensible, and the pride of the Toledo Newsbee. She tiptoed to the door and listened, but there didn't seem to be any sound now. She decided with relief that she must have been mistaken and went back to bed and to sleep. But in the morning, their mother hardly said a word at breakfast, and her cheeks looked pale and her eyes looked tired, and Martha began to wonder again. After breakfast, when their mother had gone to work, Jane, whose new fa family devotion continued to shine forth, volunteered to do the dishes alone and unaided, and this brilliant example so bestirred the finer feelings of Mark and Catherine that they insisted on helping. Martha followed them out into the kitchen and sat watching and wondering whether her worries about their mother were too far-fetched for her to mention them. Does everyone realize we've had the charm a week now? Jane was saying, scraping toast crumbs off plates and then plunging the plates into soapy water. Really, said Catherine, it seems like months at least. Mark began counting it out. The fire was Tuesday and the desert was Wednesday. We met Lancelot on Thursday and went to the movies on Friday. Jane belonged to the other family on Saturday and we rested on Sunday. 
And today is Monday, said Jane, the seventh day. I read somewhere that seven's a magic number. Maybe today will be the biggest wish yet. When you come to think of it, no great big lasting thing has happened so far, said Mark. We've had lots of adventures, but we're still just the same as we were before we found it. Our characters are improved, said Catherine, and I think we're sort of happier. I don't think Mother is, said Martha. Three faces turned to her and... and what do you mean, said three voices at once, but before Martha could answer, the telephone in the hall began to ring. Mark got to it first, he said. Mark got to it first. Hello, he said. Oh, hi, he turned to the others. It's Mr. Smith. Let me, said Jane, grabbing the phone. Honestly, Mark complained to Catherine. After we had all that hard work getting her to like him at all, at all now you'd think he were her own special property. Yes, Jane was saying into the phone excitedly. Yes, all right, we will. Yes, right away. She hung up and turned from the phone, looking serious and important. Big council meeting at the bookshop in 20 minutes. Car fare will be refunded. Can we scrape together the wherewithal? The week had been given over so completely to magic experiment that allowances remained practically un intact. So that was all right. Are we taking the charm? Martha wanted to know naturally. What else would an important council be about, said Jane witheringly. Catherine fetched a charm from its hiding place, and the four children waited for a moment when Miss Bick's attention was elsewhere, elsewhere being with the gas meter man, to steal down the front steps, hurry out the door, and run two blocks up Bancroft Street before waiting for the streetcar so she wouldn't see them from the window and take unpleasant steps. The ride downtown seemed endless, but turned out at last not to be and ten minutes later found them hurrying into the bookshop. Mr. Smith rose from his desk and came to greet them. He seemed uneasy. Hello, he said. You were quicker than I expected. Please sit down. I have something to tell you. The four children looked around, but there were piles of books on all the sitting places, so they stayed standing. Mr. Smith didn't seem to notice. He hesitated, cleared his throat, took his handkerchief out and put it away again and looked at the floor. Dear me, I find this very difficult, he said. I think perhaps, first of all, you might it might help if you stopped calling me Mr. Smith and called me Hugo. Jane shuddered. I couldn't. That's a terrible name, said Mark, ever candid. Maybe if we shortened it, Catherine agreed, or, or Catherine suggested. Hugh isn't so bad. I shall call him huge, announced Martha independently. After all, he looms large in our future. If you know what is going to happen, you know if he's going to be our... She broke off and uttered the last word in a piercing whisper that carried to all corners of the room. Stepfather! Mr. Smith heard the whisper and a blush mantled his cheeks. Then you know, he said, and here I was wondering how to break it to you. That's what I had to tell you. It's true. I have come to care very deeply for your mother, and I have asked her to be my wife. We thought you would, said Martha. Any day now, said Mark. We think it's wonderful, said Catherine. Especially me, said Jane. Thank you, said Mr. Smith. You are four very pleasant children, and I should be proud and happy to be your stepfather, and you may call me Hugh or anything you like. You may call me Hugh or anything else you like. Uncle Huge, said Mark. It's more respectful. There is only one difficulty, said Mr. Smith. Won't she have you, said Catherine? Is she being coy and hard to please? I could go and reason with her if you like, offered Mark. I'm quite good at it, really. I shall tell her I think she's very a very lucky woman to have landed you, said Martha. Please, I beg of you, do not say anything of that kind, cried Mr. Smith in alarm, blushing again. No, your mother has admitted that she thinks she could care for me in return, but yesterday evening she told me definitively that her answer is no. Or she told me definitely that her answer is no. The reason is that she believes herself to be ill, mentally ill. I leave you to guess why. She noticed, she's noticed things, said Jane, us appearing suddenly out of nowhere and things. That wish she half got, where she ran out, where she ran into you out on Bancroft Street, said Catherine. Me with all those diamonds and robbers, said Mark. I did hear her crying last night then, said Martha. Oh dear, was she, said Mr. Smith. That's bad, said Mark. And it's all our fault, said Catherine. 
The four children looked solemn, then Jane's face cleared. It's all right. We can fix it up, she said. What could be simpler? We'll confess. We'll tell her the whole thing from the beginning. Do you think she'll believe it? said Mr. Smith. Remember, your mother is a very practical person. Stubborn, too, agreed Catherine. We could show her, suggested Mark doubtfully. We could have the charm take her somewhere. That's it, Jane's eyes were shining. We'll let her wish. We'll give her whatever her heart desires. This will be the best deed yet. Come on, let's go over there now. Let's go over there right now. Don't do be careful, said Mr. Smith. Hadn't we better plan it out first? But his words were wasted on the bookshop air. Jane had the charm in her hand and rashly, excitedly, without thinking what she'd do when she got there, she wished. She wished. The next moment, they were in their mother's office. The children's mother was women's club editor of the newspaper, and that meant she wrote all those little pieces that say which ladies are going to meetings at which other ladies' houses and what they are going to have to eat. It wasn't a very important job, and her office was tiny, and today it was already quite filled by a fat lady who was telling their mother all about the potluck pageant she was planning to give for the League of Needless Women. So that when Jane and Mark and Catherine and Martha and Mr. Smith were suddenly all there in the office too, it made quite a crowd. Oh, cried their mother, turning pale as the five familiar figures appeared out of nowhere before her gaze. There it is, happening again. Really, said the fat lady to Jane and Catherine and Martha, who were wedged tightly against her. Stop shoving! I'm sorry, but we haven't time for you now, said Jane to the fat lady, and she whisked her twice as far as where she belonged. The lady was quite annoyed to find herself suddenly at home in her own kitchen, and later sued the newspaper for witchcraft. But she was never able to prove her case, and anyway, that does not come into this story. Back in her office, the children's mother sat staring palely at the place where the lady had been. It's all right, Jane told her. We know what you're thinking, but you're wrong. We can explain everything. What you thought was you going crazy was just us, said Martha. We've got a magic charm, said Mark. We've had it for a week, only we didn't tell you, said Catherine. We thought you were too old to know. And that night you went to see Aunt Grace and Uncle Edwin and wished you were home? You had it, said Jane. And it works by halves. That's how you happen to meet Mr. Smith. And that proves what a good charm it is, because we think he'd make a wonderful stepfather and not a bit Murdstone. And we've adopted him as our Uncle Huge. And we think you ought to marry him right away. Their mother looked at Mr. Smith reproachfully. You told them, she said, and now they're making all this up to make me feel better? How could you? No, that isn't it at all, said Jane. There really is a charm. Look, and she put the charm in their mother's hands. That's a nickel, said their mother. That's what I thought at first, said Jane, but it isn't. See, it's got old ancient signs on it. Why wish? Wish, why don't you? That'll prove it. For whatever your heart desires, or wait, I'll show you how. And she touched the charm where it lay in their mother's hand. I wish... She began trying to think of something simple and harmless, yet unusual. I wish two birds would fly in the window and speak to us. Immediately a chickadee flew in through the window and stood on the desk. Hello, it said and flew out again. Their mother had shut her eyes tight. Tell it to go away, she said. It just did, said Martha. Their mother opened her eyes again. That proves it, she said. It's just as I was afraid it was. Everything's been too much for me and my mind's given way. Now, now, said Mr. Smith, you mustn't get excited. But Mark interrupted him. Honestly, he said to Jane in disgust, making birds come in and talk to her. No wonder she thinks she's crazy. Whose heart's desire would that be? No, don't you remember how she always used to say she wanted to be city editor of the paper someday? Let me have that. And he took the charm from, from Jane. Careful, said Mr. Smith. It's all right. I know what to say. Mark re reassured him and he wished. The owner of the newspaper walked into the office. Ah, oh, dear lady, he said, how happy you look with your little family around you. Their mother turned a woebegone face upon him and said nothing. What part of mother's little family is Mr. Smith? Whispered Catherine to Mark, giggling. Shush, said Mark. We are making some changes in the organization, the owner of the paper went on. And I am glad to tell you that from this moment you may consider yourself city editor, not a size at, at a sizable increase in salary. No to the children's mother, shaking her head stubbornly. It isn't true. It's just some horrible, crazy dream. You aren't even real. You're just... 
a figment of my imagination. Well, really, said the owner of the paper, looking displeased. Apparently, he did not like being called a figment. Ah, oh, mother, said Mark, don't worry. Just take it. Don't you remember how you always said you could run the paper single-handed better than the rest of this whole dopey crowd does here? You don't say, said the owner of the paper coldly. In that case, perhaps I had better withdraw my offer. Perhaps you had better look for a job somewhere else. And he made a dignified exit. This is worse and worse, moaned the children's mother. Now I'm unemployed, and he'll tell everybody it's because I've gone raving, tearing mad, and he'll be right because I have. There, there, Catherine soothed her. Mark just didn't know. He couldn't because I'm the only one who knows where your heart's desire really is. She turned to the others. Mother told me once that when she was our age, she always wanted to be a bareback rider. And Catherine took the charm in her hand. Dear me, I hardly think, began Mr. Smith. But before he could finish the sentence, Catherine had wished. And he and the four children found themselves sitting in the front row of a grandstand inside an immense circus tent and the ringmaster was just cracking his whip and announcing that La Gloria, the best bareback rider in the world, would now perform her death-defying act. There was a crash of cymbals, and La Gloria rode into the ring on a white horse. La, Go La Gloria was the children's mother, only she didn't look at all like herself in pink tights and a frilly skirt, and she didn't act like herself either. She rode round the ring with grace and speed and jumped her horse through hoops with spirit and style, and when the most alarming and when... And, what was most alarming of all, to the four children, she seemed to be enjoying it. Hoopla! she cried. Allez, oop! Wee! Stop her, wailed Martha. She'll hurt herself. She'll fall! And she jumped over the rail and ran into the middle of the ring, with Jane and Mark and Mr. Smith behind her. Forgetting the charm in her hand, Catherine ran with them. La Gloria had to rein in her horse and keep it, to keep it from running them down. Get out of the way, you're spoiling the act, she said haughtily. This is awful, she doesn't know us, cried Martha. Of course she does. Don't you, said Jane. No, I don't, and I don't wish to, said La Gloria. Out of the way, the show must go on. Why, said Mark, ever willing to argue a point. Behind them in the grandstand, the audience was beginning to be restless. In my opinion, people who interrupt others' entertainments should be ejected, said a lady in the front row. You're right, said the lady next to her. They should be ejected first and then put out. An angry murmur began to grow. Down in front, yelled somebody. Get the hook, yelled somebody else. The ringmaster approached, cracking his whip. Just then it looked as though there might be unpleasantness. Then, just as it looked as though there might be unpleasantness, Catherine unwished, and they found themselves back in the newspaper office. Their mother sat at her desk, a dreamy, faraway smile on her face. Catherine turned to her anxiously. There, she said, now do you believe? Her mother's smile vanished. She looked stubborn. That didn't happen, she said. That was a dr it was a dream. How do we know all about it then, said Catherine. You don't, said their mother. You couldn't. And nothing any of the children could say would make her believe anything else. After five minutes of trying, they were all breathing hard and beginning to feel a bit desperate. May I point out, said Mr. Smith at last, that if you would only listen to me... But Martha interrupted him. Of course, if you ask me, she said, the trouble is none of those wishes were any good because we didn't make her believe first. The others looked at her. Of course, said Mark. Out of the mouths of babes, said Jane. Why didn't we think of that, said Catherine. Naturally, you have to believe in magic. Otherwise, if it starts happening to you, all sanity is despaired of. Exactly, said Mr. Smith. Now I suggest, but Martha had the charm in her hand. Oh, mother, she said earnestly, mother dear, if you just wouldn't be so stubborn about it, I wish you'd believe what we keep telling you. I wish it twice. I do, dear. I believe you, said their mother. You believe there's a magic charm? Naturally, dear, if you say so, dear. And everything's all right and you're going to get married and live happily ever after? Whatever you say, dear. There, Martha turned in triumph to the others. But Mark, looking at their mother, suspicious. But Mark was looking at their mother suspiciously. Something's wrong here, he said. That doesn't sound like mother at all. No, it doesn't, does it, dear? Said their mother. We don't want a mother that just agrees with everything all the time. No, you don't, do you, dear? Said their mother. I wouldn't either. You see what I mean? Said Mark. Why? I bet if I said the moon was made of green cheese, she'd just say yes, dear. I know, dear. 
Isn't it true, said their mother? I couldn't agree with you more, dear. The other three were just as alarmed as Mark by now. This is awful, Jane cried, turning on Martha. You've taken mother and turned her into some awful, sappy, blah character without any gumption at all, why Mr. Smith won't even want to marry her in this condition. No, he won't, will he, said their mother contentedly. I wouldn't either. There was a stunned silence. And now, said Mr. Smith in a grim voice, perhaps you will let me make a suggestion. You will permit me to make a suggestion. No one had the heart to reply. Mr. Smith took the charm from Martha's hands firmly. I suggest we start over, he said, and I suggest that we take it more slowly and that somebody thinks before acting. He held the charm out before him solemnly, almost as if he were in church. I wish first that Allison may be restored to her natural, stubborn, lovable self, and I wish it twice. But I further wish that her mind, without losing any of its natural, stubborn, lovable character, may be made open to receiving the secret of this charm, and this I wish twice. And I thirdly wish that she, she may be twice relieved of the fear that has come to her through the magic of this charm, and may be twice ready to receive any boon it may grant her. There was another silence, then the children's mother looked round at them and smiled, and it was plain that these last wild minutes, ever since they had arrived in the office, had vanished from her mind. Hello, she said. How nice of you all to come and surprise me. We came, said Mr. Smith, to bring you a gift, and he put the charm on her desk. This is a magic charm, and it works by halves. Ask twice for whatever you wish, and you will receive it once. It is from all of us, with our love. Now, what's your heart's desire? But you know what it is, said the children's mother, not picking up the charm. My heart's desire is to marry you and have the children love you as much as I do, and not to have to work on the paper any more, but stay home and take care of the children instead of having to have Miss Bick and to have the children be able to go to the country in the summers the way they've always wanted to, and to have you shave off that beard. Really? You don't like it? said Mr. Smith in surprise. I've grown rather attached to it th through the years. I'll hate to see it go, but for the rest of your desire, if you marry me, I'll do my best to give it to you without, any help of ch without the help of any charm. We won't be rich, because people who run bookshops seldom are, but summers in the country I think I can manage. He took their mother's hand, and the two of them stood looking at each other. "'Aren't you going to wish?' said Catherine after a bit. "'Why should we?' said their mother. "'We have our happiness.' "'Oh,' said Catherine, disappointed. The faces of the four children fell. They had never felt so let down in all their lives. Then after a moment, Catherine's face brightened. "'But it was a wish that brought you, to, you together in the first place,' she said, "'and it was another wish that made you meet again. "'It was really the charm that caused everything in a way.' Maybe that's the one big important thing it came into our lives to do, said Mark. You mean maybe now it's used up and won't work anymore, said Martha, alarmed. Oh, and today's the seventh day, too, cried Jane. Maybe the magic's over, she picked up the charm and turned to Mr. Smith. I don't want to butt in, and I'm sure you could give Mother her heart's desire by the sweat of your manly brow alone, she said. But just to make sure, I would wish all her wishes would come true twice, Mr. Smith gave a cry and clapped his hand to the place where his beard used to be. The four children later agreed that he looked very handsome with that. The four children agreed later that he looked very handsome without it. Only right now they didn't notice, because right now other things were happening. For it seemed as though the room suddenly began to shine, and there seemed to be a sound of far-off singing, and a faint chiming of bells all about them, and a fragrance hung in the air that was not quite cinnamon, and not quite vanilla, and not quite the perfume of all the gardens in the world, but a little like all these things, and something else too. It was the scent of magic, and their mother and Mr. Smith stood looking at each other, and didn't see the shining, or hear the singing, or sense the fragrance, because all they saw was the light of each other's eyes, and all they heard was the beating of each other's heart, and all they felt was their love for each other. By and by, the shining, and the singing, and the fragrance died away. I guess that's the last wish, all right, said Mark. It never rang bells and smelled like perf a perfume shop before. What did you say, said their mother. I guess that's the last wish, said Mark. The last wish on the charm. What charm, said Mr. Smith. They had forgotten. Now that they had their heart's desire, they had no need of any other magic. They turned and went out of the office, and the four children followed them. 
Jane still held the charm in her hand, but the children were as sure as they had ever been of anything in their short, full lives that with that last wish, the magic had gone out of it and that there would be no more enchanted adventures for them. Still, said Mark as they reached the street, and just as though the others had spoken their thoughts aloud, still, we might as well test it, see, wish something, any old dumb thing. All right, I wish I had four noses, said Jane. Everyone looked, but the usual slightly stubbed nose one re- but the usual slightly stub one remained, the only feature in the middle of the face of Jane. That settles that, said Mark. Goodbye, charm, but his voice was quite cheerful. I guess it just came to make us happy, said Catherine, and now we are. Weren't we happy before, said Martha? Oh, sure, in a kind of way, said Mark. The way some people are happy and some people are unhappy because they're born that way. But there were a lot of things we wanted changed. Now they're going to be. No more Miss Bick, said Catherine. Summer's in the country, said Jane. And a practically perfect stepfather. You know, she added, feeling suddenly rather wonderful. It looks as if we got our heart's desire, too. But all the same, she didn't throw the old used-up charm away. As they hurried to catch up with their mother and Mr. Smith, she stopped long enough to put it away carefully in her handbag. She would keep it a while longer, just in case. And that's the end of chapter 7.